Hi, everybody, and welcome to another VSM Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Krakowski, uh, joined this week by Gorn Vazovich. How's it going, everybody? Ryan Schroeder. Hey, Daniel. And we have a, a pretty remarkable guest as well. Uh, we're joined by Marshall Saunders. Hi, Daniel. Uh, he is the co-founder of uh, Saunders Daily, uh, co-author of M3, Mindset, Methods, and Metrics, and former co-owner of Remax Results. Uh, That's right. To name a few things. Uh, the list goes on and on, but for the sake of keeping it concise, we'll leave it to that for now and maybe get into that a little bit more as we go on. Uh, but you, So you sold Remax Results in, in 2014, is that right? That's right. Uh, wow. we, we grew that to the largest Remax franchise in the world. Wow. It's hard to not want to just dive into that and spend a whole <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but yeah. was that by, was that by by a local group or? Uh, uh, it's actually my partner. I was a fifty fifty owner, okay. and the person that owned the other fifty percent bought me out. Okay. Oh, another fifty fifty partnership. Huh. Interesting. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, but um, just to kind of dive into that, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned that you know it was the biggest office in the world, and how much of that? Um, was based on the your book, the M3 Mindset, Methods, and Metrics. Was it modeled after the success that you've had in the real world, the book itself? Well, I would say yes uh, is the fundamental answer. Uh, I wrote the book after I left, uh, after I sold my half of the company. But I wouldn't say that the growth of the actual company was because of that or, or those, uh, those ideals. But the fact that we had the most productive real estate agents uh, pretty much in the country, uh, real estate agents that sold the most units per person, was largely based on the principles in this book that were championed. And I in no way am taking credit for all those <laughs> <laughs> ideas. Really, really, I'm, I'm not. I, I tried to distill them and I tried to explain them in the way that I explained them to real estate agents. Mm -hmm. But they go back. Uh, my partner, John Colopy, who bought me out. My dad, uh, Bill Saunders, who started Remax Results back in 1986, as well as Tom Ferry, Brian Buffini, um, all the the you know the old time real estate guys who you know kind of championed all these ideas. I just kind of tried to take them, distill them down, and educate people on what they were. So yeah, so, what, what so you tried to transcribe them and then exactly. monetize them. That's right. <laughs> right. Got it, right. I want to make money yeah. off yeah. of them, but uh, they aren't necessarily my right. ideas. And uh, <laughs> sorry for uh, the listeners that are interested in the book. It is available on Amazon. Yep, on uh, Amazon. They can pick it up um, as far as a hard copy and audio or just hard copy at this point. Uh, on Amazon, they can do both. They can go to m3rebook.com okay. and they can get the audio uh, audible.com or the hardcover book, however they want. Right. So in case you want to be a, a successful real estate agent, you may want to pick that up. Yeah, I'm getting one right now. <laughs> For sure. Um, so... A lot of times, I think a lot of our listeners may not necessarily be in the real estate sure. uh, world themselves. They may not be realtors, but they are business owners. They're looking to, to find good people to motivate them. And that's a struggle that I think we struggle with. Um, I, I can't think of anybody who doesn't. What did you do that was different that you felt like you were able to produce these amazing results? Well. Being successful in real estate, you know, the book is called Mindset, Methods, and Metrics. And really, it starts with mindset. And that's why that comes first in that title. Because if you don't completely commit and have the right mindset for what real estate is, what it requires of you, and what you want to do, um, then all the rest of it, there's so many kind of things that keep coming at you when you're a real estate agent and when you're in the real estate business. You know, should I be on Zillow? Should I be on this? Should yeah, I do this? Exactly. Should I do this? Should I do this? And it really is a matter of constant bombardment of possible methods. 
which is fine. I mean, we, we, we want lots of options, right? And we want lots of ways to be successful. Yeah. But if you don't, if you haven't established the correct mindset of how you're going to approach the business, how you're going to work with clients, how you're going to run your business as far as budgeting, time blocking, all of that stuff, then you just get kind of run ragged by all the methods that are out there. And you just kind of, uh, it really can be a business that even though profitable, you know, a lot of people that leave the real estate business were actually making money. They weren't, they weren't leaving because they weren't being successful mm -hmm. financially. They left because they just had to get off that habit trail, that, that hamster wheel. And, and so they, they allowed the business to run them rather than them running the business. So I guess to answer your question, the most important thing that I initiate with my coaching clients and the people who read the book is having the right mindset and having the right setup to run your business. And then down the stream, downstream, we can figure out what all the methods are by which you get leads and by which you get clients. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know a lot of us in this industry, we have a, a plan, you know, use Zillow as an example. Mm -hmm. So I'll follow up with that. But a lot of people look at Zillow and they they look at their schedule and they say, hey, I'm not very busy right now. I don't have a ton of deals right. coming my way. I better throw some money into Zillow to try and get some deals right. without having an overall strategy, right. um, without you know having a, a top of the funnel engagement, without bringing people in and having a clear path of, well, why specifically are you in Zillow? Why are right. you in this specific area? Right. Um, so, so when someone does go to you for coaching, how do you instill that mindset? How do you help them realize what, what they should be doing uh, based on who they are? Well, if it's somebody that's already been in the industry a while, it's kind of a, a more of a matter of peeling the onion, you know, kind uh -huh. of trying to get back to the core idea of why you do this, what you really are, are kind of, um, I know it's an overused word, but passionate about uh -huh. pursuing, um, you know, what do you want to do? And then how do we form the real estate business to follow suit with that? There are people, uh, one of the co-writers of this book, uh, Brandon Doyle, who are very invested in technology. They want internet leads. You know, they want mm -hmm. to just get the massive number of leads, kind of work it down through a funnel, and they have a system to do it. And, you know, if that's their core kind of desire, that's awesome. But someone who's more of a relationship or, like, does much better in open houses, much does but does much better in kind of having buyer seminars, something like that, mm -hmm. they kind of look at other people who are doing internet leads and they're like, oh, I got to do that because that's kind of the way the business is going. And yeah. they're a horrible fit for it. Right. Uh, someone who doesn't want to work with internet leads to work with internet leads, really, really, really bad fit. I mean, you got Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of times people get caught in the trap, especially with internet leads, where I think a lot of times people want to get those because they don't want to go out and talk to people. Right. But right. inevitably, that's a necessity to, to move any deal forward. So. And you, you got to be careful. I, I think the world is Zillow, so I'm not uh, putting them down or, or, mm -hmm. or, you know, viewing them as the big bad uh, uh, force in the real estate industry, but if you rely solely on getting Zillow leads and, you know, it costs you 150 bucks for a certain amount and you have no other means by which to build your business, well, then they come along and they say, well, now it's 500. Well, now <laughs> right. it's 2,000. Yeah. Well, now it, it's 10,000. It would 000. be good to be Zillow. <laughs> yeah, right. The business. Because they yes. kind of can do that. And, and that's a bad way of having your business to have somebody else determine your cost of getting clients. Yeah. And and so have it as a method, but you know, whether you want it as a core of your business is is all relative to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It is tough. I mean, th for every single real estate agent, there's a different way of making money in real estate. Mm -hmm. And some people concentrate on investment, some people concentrate on large investment, some people are commercial. You know, it's any number of ways of building a business. Um, the core of this book is really toward residential real estate agents and it really is um, have your machine of contacting your database. The yeah. In-person phone call or person-to-person -person phone calls, in-person meetings, handwritten notes, some electronic communication that can be substantive. That's the core meat of your business. That's the engine. And then you have to have three or four intakes into your engine. That could be Zillow leads. It could be open houses. It could be farming. It could be any number of things. But that allows kind of new people to come into the engine. Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. And 
so, so say someone picks up your book, they read it, they love it, they're really excited and motivated. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do is, is there an option for them to, to get a hold of you for, for coaching or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, uh, I have a coaching company. Uh, they can see it at msm3coaching.com, Marshall okay. Saunders, m3coaching.com. And, uh, and yeah, uh, what I do there is I have a video-based uh, uh, called Video Micro Coaching, which they watch an exercise of me on video. Then they respond to me via video on their mobile devices or on their iPads, which is really freaky to a lot of people. Right. And I like it because <laughs> you can't just passively sit back and take my class. You ha- you have to click the button and you have to respond to me via video. So it's very a uh, lot of accountability. And then I respond via text uh, back to them. And so it starts off as you know a generic exercise that everyone gets, but then it becomes personalized as we go back and forth. Yeah. How does that make you feel as a broker, knowing if you pay for that for someone that they have to be actively engaged, Ryan? I like it. I think it's confrontational to the point of you know forcing them to to participate I think it's a lot the same as when we do in-person trainings and you know you call on someone and you know they might be looking at their phone or drifting off into la la land but you I would snap, never do that to snap, snap them back agents. a real estate <laughs> no. agent no, no. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right and and actually my my whole back office on that system has metrics. How many times did they log in? How many videos did they watch all the way through? How many videos did they respond to? And then I can go back to a broker and go, okay, you know, you you required these 20 brand new agents to take this class. And part of your thing was, hey, I'll take you on new, but you got to take this class. I can go back to report to them like, you know, this person paid for it, but they really didn't cooperate too much and they didn't really take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Whereas this person did and they all receive a score and all that sort of stuff. I like the idea of quantifiable metrics for that because when we do them in person, for example, you know, we're just kind of basing it on, you know, the last training that they were at, how, how did they participate, how engaged were they and everything like that, but there's no substantive data. Right. So that's why the, one of the M's in the training is metrics. I I think metrics is a huge part of it. And I was slow to this because I'm not a math guy, um, but metrics are so critically important really in any business but this is how it relates to real estate you know uh, by studying where your business comes from and what your conversion ratios are between you know leads to appointments to appointments to contracts to contracts to closings it's so critical because sometimes you can just make a 10 percent adjustment let's say on your conversion ratio between a lead and an appointment if you could just convert 10% more. Maybe it's some language that you can uh, introduce in that initial phone call or some mailing or just something that you offer that other people don't. But just a slight variation, 10%, can sometimes trickle down to a hundred to $200,000 of income difference yeah. for a real estate agent. But they don't know that because no one tracks their metrics. No one tracks where their appointments or their leads come from. It's just like whoever calls you, you try to close as many yeah. as possible and you really don't know where you should be putting your time and attention. Yeah, I think I'm in that trap a little bit. I <laughs> could be doing a better job of yeah, I was thinking the same everything. thing. I think that you know, we're very fond of our processes and our abilities and everything, <laughs> but um, I don't think that there's been enough work to to track, you know, where things are coming from, conversion ratios, etc. I would say that metrics have become um, a big part of our business in 2016 across mm-hmm. the board from tracking information on the properties that we invest in to um, who's getting what training and you know where things are coming from and I think that's more and more going to be a bigger part of the business as we continue to grow I think I'm so optimistic about real estate I think the business will change a great deal but this whole new generation of Millennials who are coming into this business I think they bring this whole new attitude, this whole new kind of vibrancy to this business, a very customer-focused attitude. And um, I think it's going to be kind of a, it's going to change a lot, but it's going to be a new kind of dawn, a new kind of generation for real estate. I think it's really, really You want to really log good. some some 10-year predictions here, some <laughs> formally here, so we can check back? <laughs> My 10-year prediction is that life will get very difficult for kind of the more larger traditional brokerages. They're, they're, they're slowly being kind of squeezed out of the business. You see the growth of teams. 
And what do people go when they join a real estate team? What are they looking for? They're looking for training. They're right. looking for leads. They're looking for kind of a camaraderie. Well, they're joining these teams, but they aren't f primarily because they're not finding them from the larger traditional brokerages. And I think that's a huge failure, um, not on purpose, but just kind of over the course of years. My generation of the Gen X came in. We wanted to be very independent. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We don't want to be part of a team. We just, you know, leave us alone. And so brokerages kind of uh, molded around that. And so they became uh, places where you paid them and they didn't kind of interfere a lot in your everyday life. The uh, millennial generation comes in and they want to be part of teams. They would like to be part of dynamic teams that are going someplace and have a vision and and get together and and, and have friendships but also create something and yeah. so these brokerages have been kind of caught like oh wow we we weren't investing in this at all and now suddenly that's where it's all, all i think that. you see some of that in big corporations too the mm -hmm. kind of the departure from the private office to the open workspaces sure. and um you know the the collaborative work environments and things of that nature and um that's interesting i i like where you're going with that obviously hearing that the big brokerages are going to suffer <laughs> brings is music to my ear i think it makes sense a little bit too though if you think about kind of the demographic and the world that they grew up in where you know i guess i can count myself as a millennial and my i've everything that i've ever done has been through a computer right. um, they've all had tutorials they've all been everything that's ever been designed in my lifetime has been user friendly that's a term in the, you know that they use to, when, right. when they're setting it up and designing it and the idea of creating a strong entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. when everything has been, you know, the path has been highlighted for you the whole mm -hmm. time, it, it's harder to get to, I think, for a lot of people. So uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Not just, agree, not only do I agree with it, but I, I think the why makes a lot of sense as well. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So, you know, we do take on a fair amount of people as agents to our company that are brand new to the business. Right. And um, it's hard for me to even remember sometimes being new to the business because I've been doing it for more than 10 years and um, did a couple of different kinds of real estate. But uh, if you were going to lay out the first 90 days of a person who's brand new to the business, all they have is a dollar and a dream. Um, you have a couple of quick highlights that you'd recommend? A couple of quick highlights. Well, um, it, we are seeing a lot more new people in the business, and it used to be... Thank you, HGTV. For yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's good or bad, yeah. but... Uh, you don't know the prices on all these flips and rentals. Yeah. And, and all these, uh, you know, the real estate schools that are in the area, I mean, every single class that they have in every single classroom, whether it be night classes, day classes, weekends, multiple classrooms in each location and multiple locations, every single classroom is at fire code capacity. They can't take more people legally. <laughs> and, and so there's tons of people. And that's even with online offerings. You can get uh, uh, licensed right. online now. Um, so there's tons and tons of new people coming in. And I, and I do believe it's fueled by um, probably a, a vast misperception of what real estate is. For sure. They watch Million Dollar Listing. Oh, that looks so fun. You know? <laughs> yeah. I always laugh at people that say, you know, I got into real estate because I just love houses. Well, nothing will beat that out of you more than being in the real estate business. <laughs> <laughs> you, won't, you won't in a year. <laughs> um, but uh, as far as new real estate agents, I guess it goes back to the having the right mindset. Um, what experience do you have in kind of going directly consumer driven uh, commission only sales? Do you have any concept of that? Um, if you don't, that doesn't mean you won't be successful, but your learning curve is even going to be longer because no matter how much you uh, psychologically can conceptualize or, or, or mentally conceptualize working on commission only, it is extremely, extremely difficult to actually embody that. Um, so that's that is, and, and also, you have to think how hard you will work at this business and at least multiply it by 10. <laughs> if you aren't willing to and knock... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, <laughs> if you aren't willing to knock on 200 doors, door knocking, 
when it's really cold outside every Saturday and you aren't willing to have uh, two open houses on a Sunday and go up to at least eight houses per open house on the Wednesday and Thursday before and you aren't willing to do that, then do not go into real estate because the the great thing about real estate is that you don't have to spend a lot of money. It it can be completely your effort that gets you involved in real estate. And then you build a bedrock. Then once you have a bedrock business that you can build on, then you start going, well, where could I use a thousand dollars of marketing money that gets me the most bang for my buck? You aren't downstream going, I hope I spend that thousand bucks so that it means something to me. It, it it's, it's hard to explain, but like you're either upstream from those ideas or you're downstream from them. And my dad used to say, uh, like even a dead fish can swim downstream. You know, like <laughs> uh, like you you you're always once you're downstream from the business and you're hoping that something comes your way, you will always be a victim of this business. And if the business is down or if the economy's down, you're down, and um, you're never going to kind of outpace the what what the economy chooses to give you. I like that you mention, you know, the door knocking, the open houses, all those kinds of things, because a lot of times agents, you know, they see new to the business, you know, they see the, uh, the million dollar listing and right. all these other shows and they see the big commissions and the rips, but they don't know the dirty work right. that goes into it, uh, especially when you're starting out. Um, I think, you know, Gorn and I have been in this business long enough now that we're fortunate enough to have a base of customers from our property management side, right. and investment side that... Um, um, we can kind of market to them and things come our way and it maybe looks a little easier than it really is because they see us 10 years in, not right. not day one in the in the hustle. So they walk in and see your gorgeous offices and go, oh, I want that. Of course. Right? Yeah. You don't you got to you got to pay your dues and you paid your dues. They, yeah. And, they, didn't, they didn't see it five years ago. Yeah. And you, <laughs> you you made your bones in property management, like which is like the hardest way to get into hardest the real estate the business. Yeah. So you have uh, you. You've really seen the downside. Yeah, it's true. And I think Gorn and I both have had jobs where we've, you know, trying to get this going where we've made 50 cold calls a day. And mm -hmm. I don't think people understand how cold uncomfortable call. that is. Right. And I think you kind of touched on it going back to the rudimentary way of doing sales is just as important, even though uh, we live in sure. the information Absolutely. age. And I'm all about right. the Internet. Same uh, here. What I kind of have that, you know, most of our agents don't have is that I was in the trenches in a queue making 100 dials a day. So I know that aspect and that does produce business. So does online where you mentioned, you know, a lot of new agents that, oh, I got my real estate license. I'm going to call Zillow and, that, and then I'm going to wait by the phone to pick up, you know, and, and, and make some make some sales that way. Right. No one's really doing the... Uh, door knocking and it's meant, funny that you mentioned that because I talked to a new agent who basically did that and just blew it up had like 30 listings right. from just door knocking it's absolutely. something as simple as that You're but it, it trains you to think the right way and yeah, and I'm with you because I love technology and I love how the business has become so technological right. I really do love it and but it's those are all tools right it's like hammering a nail you got you know a piece of wood and a nail um you know, you could use a rock <laughs> and hammer it in, or you could use, you know, all sorts of, you know, smaller hammers, larger hammers, sledge hammers. Then you got, you know, your hydraulic nail uh, guns. And if you start with the hydraulic nail gun, and then suddenly you don't have a plug-in or you don't have hydraulics, you're like, well, how the hell does this nail <laughs> go in this wood? You know? Right. It, and, and that doesn't mean that the smart person is using the hydraulic nail gun because that's the most efficient way to do it. So it doesn't mean that that's wrong. But if you don't understand the fundamental of this nail is going into the wood and why and how, then you then you become more reliant rather than using it as a tool. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of funny because the two people can be sitting at desks right next to each other using the same piece of equipment and the same piece of technology, both making money off of it, but the mindset's different. The mindset is this is what is creating this for me and the person next to him is saying this is the tool by which I apply the fundamental craft. The person that sees it as a tool to apply the fundamental craft is going to be far more successful and also 
their business is going to be more sustainable through ups and downs in the market. Yeah, I think it's one of the challenges of our generations and the millennials is to kind of wrap their head around the fundamentals Mm -hmm. uh, of just door knocking or cold calls. Most don't even know what a cold call is or just, you know, picking up the phone and opening up the yellow pages, which doesn't even exist anymore, I don't think. Uh, Yellow what? (laughs) Yeah, and and making the phone call. So, um, and that's what we're trying to find out is kind of the right balance between using technology, but also the rudimentary way of getting out there, meeting people, going to open houses, door knocking, because at the end of the day, you know, we're not selling an electronic product. We're selling ourselves and, and selling a piece of real estate. We're going to have to interact with a, a person, mm-hmm. uh, you know, 100 percent of the time. Right. So and, and we are. It's very frightening. I mean, I, it's kind of easy to hide behind or, or use technology as our buffer. You know, it's easier to send an email than to call. For sure. You know, and yeah. and it, it just and sometimes it's more efficient. You know, to confirm an appointment, calling someone is not as efficient as just sending an email. So there's a time and a place for it. But fundamentally, I think you know you got to go to a new agent and go. I want you to get a customer by the end of this weekend. And I don't want you to use one ounce of electronics to do it. Not texting, <laughs> not not emailing, not calling, nothing. Go to people. Get with a them. notepad, a pen. Right. And, and that just made me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> and, and have Daniel, them slam the do door it. in your face and, and know how to deal with rejection and know how to deal with no. And, um, you know, because a lot of times on electronics, if they don't like you or don't want, they just won't respond. Right. Yeah. We don't necessarily get the door slammed in our face. You guys being in property management. You know what life is like dealing face to face with people who don't want to interact with you, and the, sometimes the interaction can be kind of tough. Right, I, I, I didn't personalize. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's it, it's actually easier to get um, if not you know an answer or maybe a yes mm-hmm. when you are face to face with agree. an individual at the door versus how easy is it for me to delete your email? Y- yep. You won't even know. Right, uh, but if I come to your office and say. Hi, you know, let's do business. You're gonna be wanna. You're gonna want to talk to me. You're not gonna want to say, well, no, because right. easy, it's easier to say yes. And in a way, it hasn't electronics and technology made it even more effective to door knock? I mean, it used to be a time. I would agree with that. When there used to be door to door salesmen and vacuum cleaner salesmen, and people used to bombard you at your door. You know, yeah. All those signs, no solicitation, used to be on people's doors. Now people don't get that person to person interaction much. And they kind of appreciate it a bit more, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's an op- there's an opportunity if you're listening, you yeah. know. Yeah, I always like the... Go, if somebody's going high tech, go low tech. And it's free. Yes. <laughs> it's true. And um, I've always used this as a strategy when dealing with confrontation or negotiations. Doing something in person, face to face, I think you have a certain leg up. I think people are more cordial. Um, if you're calling someone on the phone, that's kind of the next level down. Um, it's a little bit more confrontational, but they could still hang up on you right. at any second. But um, using an email or a text message, you could simply ignore it. It's it's not confrontational at all. You well, don't get to get in their face. There's a simple truth them. too that you know. Uh, 100% of your deals, you're going to have to interact with someone <laughs> on a personal level. You're going to have to talk to them either on the phone or in person, um, almost always in person at some point. Uh, the technology component never covers that. Mm-hmm. It's still a fundamental skill. It's the base of the pyramid that you need to build the rest on top of. And look what we've learned from social networking, that people are so bold to be jerks and to say <laughs> such inflammatory things. Right. They'd never say in a person-to-person conversation. If it was Absolutely. four people sitting around yeah. having a beer, no way. They're going to they're gonna be more respectful. They're going to listen to other points of view. But when it's you know all electronic, you can just be as strident and as kind of evil as you want to. <laughs> and that comes into play in, in, in negotiations. Um, you know, sometimes people... People would go, oh, well, you know, he went down a thousand, I'll go up a thousand. In electronics, it's very easy to get, go, you know, I don't care, I'm not listening to you, you know, you, it's my way or no way. Right. Yep, we ca- I call that e hating when you uh, <laughs> when you get behind an email and you just you know uh, lace off a tirade there and then um, <laughs> and then hit send and you know it, it's nice because they don't get to respond immediately you know you right. get to say everything you want to say but right. those are those tend to be the regrettable ones yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's much easier to hide behind a computer right. for sure.
So, but yeah. So one thing that I wanted to talk about that I thought was very interesting and was sort of the catalyst for you and I getting to meet each other Mm -hmm. a while ago was, um, VSM had been looking to use the 506C legislation, right. um, and we had gotten approval for, it's called VSM Fund 1, and it was uh, it was meant to be a blind pool f- mm-hmm. to invest in residential properties here in the Twin Cities that our company would handpick and all that. And inevitably, when I would bring it up to somebody, they'd say, oh, like Saunders Daily, like Saunders Daily. And so... <laughs> um, I eventually was like, okay, well, I got to, you know, meet the the man behind it. And that's how we got together. Um, how have things been going for you? I know the last time we met, you said that um, the adoption of it was a, a little slower than you'd like, but are things right. picking up? Is it yeah, more of the same? To some degree. Um, you know, we I, I left my REMAX results in October of 2014. I, I founded Saunders Daily with Jason Daly, um, who owns a company called Brandography, right away. Uh, we, we got it up and running within a couple months. Um, we started initially 506 C's and 506 C's if you're not familiar are it's a new thing it, it was started with the Jobs Act in 2012 right. and the Jobs Act was totally bogus it was jumpstart our business startups it had nothing to do with creating jobs but they felt like well no congressperson could ever vote against something called the Jobs Act so <laughs> that's how they got it through and uh, but what that in- involved was a, a repeal a slow repeal to the 1930 investment act what was happening it was uh, the Great Depression. People, if you ever saw Grapes of Wrath or maybe mm-hmm. even read the book, I, I I didn't do that in high school. I just watched <laughs> the movie. But um, people were dying. You know, people were in America were starving to death and and dying of poverty, and it was an incredible thing. And they were uh, unfortunately a lot of people were taking advantage of them. Uh, buy this piece of land. Buy this. Invest in this. You know, uh, new thing. And the federal government said, no, if you can't afford to lose the money, you can't invest. It's illegal for you to invest in something unless you can afford to lose the money. Well, that involved then only accredited investors could could invest in things. So like 90% of our wealth in the United States is built in invest is built by investing in companies and investing in large pools in real estate. And only 3% of our population can legally do that. So 3% of the population has the avenue of 90% of the wealth building. Seems fair, right? Yeah, right. (laughs) And it started to protect people, you know, so it started for good reasons, but it didn't take long for like all these guys to go, holy smoke, you know, like this world is ours now. We're the only one that can make money off of this country. And I, created, I would agree with that. I think yeah. that when it first started being talked about the Jobs Act, I was overjoyed because I felt like it allowed the Main Street right. uh, type business person to compete with the Wall Street That's types. Right. And I thought it leveled the playing field. It, Yeah, that was the intent. Mm-hmm. It, we still got a long way to go. So now on the federal level, we can do something called general solicitation. You used to not be able to uh, you know, tell people about these investments. Right. 506C, as long as the person is accredited, which means that they make $200,000 a year individually, $300,000 as a married couple, or have a million dollars of net worth not counting their private, uh, their primary residence. If you have one of those three things, then you are accredited. And it doesn't seem that high of a bar. Only 3% of America's population uh, fits into that uh, 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 matrix. And so, but if you're accredited and uh, you, you can come and we can go out and we can advertise this, hey, here's a building and we'd like all of you to come invest in it, right? And we can take out ads in the paper, we can put it on websites and all that sort of stuff. Now, uh, what what was also pushed forward was true crowdfunding, where you don't have to be accredited. And the federal government finally came out uh, kind of mid this year with their very anemic crowdfunding provisions. Um, Indiegogo has started a few um, equity-based yep. crowdfunds, and, and I'm, that's awesome. It's just, it's so restrictive. It's like $2,500 or $3,500 per year, and it's just really restrictive. So that's why 
states have gone out and started their own crowdfunding. Uh, they do not have to necessarily uh, follow all the federal rules. They can make their own rules within a state jurisdiction. And so uh, a good friend of mine, Zach Robbins, my lawyer, went out and he was one of the many people who wrote mm -hmm. uh, MinVest. That was passed a year and a half ago, then went through a long process of public comment and blah, blah, blah. And then finally, they issued the first application for MinVest on June 20th. We were right there that day. We put in our application. And then through you know another three or four months, finally in kind of early November of this year, they approved us. And so uh, now we did that under a name called VentureNear.com. Mm -hmm. We wanted to differentiate that from Saunders Daily because Saunders Daily is pretty much real estate only and only to accredited investors. But I would like at some point to kind of implode Saunders Daily and just have that forward to VentureNear.com. And VentureNear.com uh, and, and any MinVest portal will allow unaccredited investors to come in and be part of these investor pools. I know there's some nuances to it, um, but aren't there limitations on yep. how many fundraises and dollar values and things? Uh, one offering on uh, MinVest has to be limited to $2 million of raised capital, and it just up from a $1 million very recently. And then also each individual unaccredited investor is limited to a $10,000 investment. Accredited investors are still unlimited. So there's still that condescending, like, if you don't make a lot of money, we don't trust you to spend your own money. And <laughs> and I find that, I mean, you know, we get a lot of protests on different things going on right now. Why people aren't every day out protesting this blatant form of discrimination that you can't do things because you don't make enough money. So you could be, uh, you could teach business law at St. Thomas and make $98,000 a year. Right. You can't be trusted to invest your own money, but all these other crazy people can go invest in Bernie Madoff all that they want to and throw away their money. They're fine to do it. And it's just, uh, it. I know that um, the world can be a scary place when it comes to investment, and a lot of people are ripped off. So we do have to have some protection. Yep. Right. But that condescension that you don't make a lot of money, so therefore you can't be trusted to use your own money the way you see fit is, um, I think, just totally wrong. It's and, uh, such an institutional issue, too, because not only have people been denied the ability to invest, but because it's been removed from their their life experience and their families that they don't, they're not exactly. even looking to. They, it's not something that they realize is even missing, you're, further you're totally exacerbating right. this. So now that it is open, it's still, I think they're going to be a, a learning some growing pains for Absolutely. people knowing that they can start putting their money to work. When we go to these crowdfunding conventions and we get together with all the other people who are doing crowdfunding, there's this kind of feeling, there's this worry out there that somebody's going to go out there and in the name of crowdfunding, they're going to rip people off. And this whole movement, this whole idea is going to take a, a giant step backwards. Mm -hmm. So we're all kind of self-policing each other and, and trying to help each other because we know that no one's going to get wealthy doing equity crowdfunding for a long time. So this is a labor of love. Mm -hmm. You know, I've spent about a quarter of a million dollars on legal fees. And we, we you know, hire out our portal at $3,500 a pop. You know, it, I'll never make that money back. You know, this is not a money-making venture. But it's more like to get this movement going. And, and that's where all these people kind of are, are leading this whole charge across the country right now are really more in the mindset of just getting this done and getting it done the right way, establishing protocols, working with the federal and state governments and then you know maybe over the next 10 years kind of get this in place i do know what you're referring to because i remember when we first met um i was worried that you were going to view me as competition and some of the other people that i've spoken to who are in the crowdfunding arena you're absolutely right we're we're all looking for this is still in its infancy right. where just for its ability to survive is more important to, right. to us right now than uh, than beating each other out of the business. Absolutely. So. Survive yeah. and not uh, make any mistakes to give the whole industry a black eye because, as, as you mentioned, how important it is to have another 
opportunity other than Wall Street, especially after everything that's happened. Right. It's um, something that we have to do. Right. It's, we have to make wealth building more universal. Universal. And, and um, like you mentioned, you know, before the 3% versus right. what about the other 97, you have to make it accessible somehow. Right. And the rich will always get richer, right? I mean, we all know that, you know, a guy walking down the street with $100,000 cash is going to have a lot more opportunity to build their wealth than a guy with $100 cash. I mean, that, but that's, it's fair in a way because, like, you know, he has just as many opportunities. He just has more to start with. Okay. So that, uh, you know, there's no kind of uh, uh, leveling the playing field as far as that goes. But there, it shouldn't be federally mandated that the guy with a hundred thousand has more than the guy with a hundred dollars you know it should be uh, they both have access to it it just this guy is much less in it and it's going to take a lot 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 longer to grow a hundred dollars than it is a hundred thousand yeah That's and it. the numbers that they have set up i it seems pretty arbitrary mm -hmm. you know the, right. the, the, there's no i, I mean I, I can't think of any specific example where at precisely two hundred thousand <laughs> right. dollars exactly. it's like okay now i get it like right. you know 198 no yeah. you're not smart enough but you know 201 you're a genius yeah. exactly so, so i had a question regarding the the new venture the venture near dot com mm -hmm. uh where you don't have to be a credit investor to get into it uh, as far as um if you can just walk us through how that process sure. works that'd be great um and what exactly you're investing is it a single asset or is it multiple assets across you know sure. minnesota well right now we're the uh well there is one other approved portal but venture near dot com is an, not the, but an approved portal of MinVest. They're very careful about their language. Um, so that's not to imply that, that we're the only one. Yep. But we're on there. We don't have one single offering because mm -hmm. now how it works is once we're a, a, a portal, then each individual offering needs to file with the state. Gotcha. And we have currently, we have like seven people that are in their filing period. So that might mean within a month, then we have quite a few offerings. The first offerings are almost all breweries. <laughs> they all Unsurprising. Breweries. Yep. <laughs> Mostly we, in Northeast, maybe. <laughs> few of them. more. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and they're almost all breweries. They're they're great folks, and they have good business plans, and they've they've spent a lot of money, several thousand dollars, getting their offerings done right, and now they're going to seek uh, investment. And I think that there's going to be a time period where breweries and restaurants and coffee shops are a little bit more um, kind of you know as this becomes comes more mature it's going to start off that way not that there's anything wrong with that but it's going to be local stuff because the great thing about crowdfunding is hey i want to start a coffee shop at the corner of franklin and hennepin i'm going to go out to my neighborhood right and i'm going to go meet people who live in the neighborhood and go you know will you become a part owner of this and so not only am i going to be raising money for it and getting equity to start my business but i'm also going out and getting customers and advocates for my business it's kind of a a litmus test. Listen, if you can't go out and get customers and, and people to invest in you, you probably don't have the customer base to do well in that neighborhood. You know? which, which I think is uh, another big factor that makes this uh, very appealing uh, where, you know, in a standard 401k and you're just kind of giving your money, you don't know really where it goes. But it gives you a certain sense of uh, pride and pride and ownership sure. if you're a local person investing in local business where you can see or you can do business with on a daily basis. Right. So, and yeah. It's exactly. yeah, I mean, I think the analogy that you used, I mean, there's a million of them you can think of, but, you know, if you live in a community where everything is in walking distance, but you don't have a dry cleaner in your area, you right. know, you can pull together the people and it can be uh, something that you're adding to the right. community that's for the benefit of the people around and they can be investors and clients in it potentially. And I love how it levels the playing field. I'm writing a new book now and it, it's kind of building on um, you know how we call this the sharing economy with Uber and Airbnb which is incredible because it couldn't yeah, happen without the Yeah that's where it's going. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing a book called The Owner Economy right where a person can walk down the street and they might be a nurse, a bank teller, something like that, not necessarily, you know, upper echelon, C-level, C-suite type person, mm -hmm. but they're walking down the street and go, oh, I own part of that coffee shop. I own part of that donut shop. I, I own like one one thousandth of that 11 unit apartment building. I own part of that. I own part of that. And, and they're not 
you know, well-to-do, but they are an owner in their community. So when they go shopping at the coffee shop, it's not only because they have a great product, but because I own part of that. Right. And I'm I, I think it's a benefit just every mm-hmm. which way. You know, you get you you get an investment piece of it, but you also get the ownership. You also get the community piece, uh, right. you know, in the equation. So I, I think it's just it, – it's very new, but I – that's where things are heading. Cause. And look at how it's changed, how it's helped the co- consumer experience. I mean, your average cab ride is a lot better now. You know, like, I mean, <laughs> e- either they're competing with Uber or they are Uber, right? And and the people that you interact with, the cleanliness of the car, the accoutrement, the, the, the idea that they know where they're going and they have a neighborhood knowledge. And Airbnb is kind of doing the same way. It's really stepping up. If you're an established hotel business, yep. you got to compete now with Airbnb where everybody could be in the hotel business. So we got to provide a better level of customer service, cleaner, better, safer, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think for the most part, um, you know, you're, you're paying same if not more, but people are still going after it because of the convenience right. and how easy it is. Right. Um, so, I mean, just when I go, um, I you know travel. I I, I rent a silver car, and right. that the is Audis, right? yeah, that's yeah. like the ultimate customer service experience when you compare it to any other uh, rent a car agency. It's unreal, and the price is same if not lower. That's only I'm, a few and, locations, though, right? Yeah, they yeah. have a major cities, uh, Phoenix, Chicago, nice. and stuff like. But it's the most convenient, efficient um, way to just make this transaction work. It's not a hassle at all. And I'm just like, wow, how is this not exploding yet? But yeah, it's coming. Just, I love like that I said, concept because you know the rental car experience is so insane. You know, it's forty nine dollars a day, and you get your bill, and fees, you've, you've had fees, it two days, fees, and it's like yes. nine hundred dollars. Like what? Where does it? And then it's always like, well, what car do you want? Well, we'll upgrade you to this. Upgrade. Just right. give me the one car, a good car. I love that. <laughs> I love that concept of this is our car. This right. is the, the type I, of car that we rent. Right. I think the again that platform is just it's it's going to explode if it hasn't already, and there's a lot of money backing it up and things like airbnb uber and all they're not going away is really and no matter how much you know states or whoever is fighting just just like tesla right it's not going away okay the car dealers can go you know you know fight for their rights etc but it's only going to get bigger I love it. So have you noticed from looking at all the different offerings that are out there and and looking at the difference between uh, an accredited and the unaccredited investors, uh, is there a big distinction between the two and what they're looking for to put their money into? Yeah. uh, You mentioned the slowness and kind of the frustration with the slowness early on, Ryan. Um, There... What we were doing is when we could only go toward a credit, a credit investor with 506 Cs, they weren't too interested in our apartment, our seven unit apartment building that got like a 7% return, mm-hmm. which in my world of real estate, hey, that's great. You know, 7% <laughs> right. a year, every year, you know? Yeah. Um, but they, they were looking for 20x returns and, you know, kind of uh, major returns. So that's one thing with going where, to. Where a, are they getting 20? Jeez. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got to go there. No, yeah. not. Where they're it's getting, a Ponzi scheme. Where they're getting promised. Yeah, right? yeah. it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> and and that's why I love real estate. It's just it's more steady. It's more tried and true. It's uh, you don't make a huge killing, but also you get that kind of constant return. And especially it, plus, it makes sense and simple. It's you know someone right. can easily understand. Tangible. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, one of the things I love and I kind of preach about buying a single family home because only because it's more accessible to most investors mm-hmm. is. You know, you lock in your interest rate. You lock in your interest rate, and but yet at the same time, rents go up over time. There is, uh, you know, appreciation and and uh, cost of living goes up. Your your spread becomes larger and larger over time. How many investments do you have that actually account for cost of living in how what you gain? You yeah. know, like if you earn eleven percent over the ten years, you've actually kind of lost money because right. the, in the meantime, it's cost of living has gone up and the then inflation has gone up. So 
I, I, I like that a lot. So that, that, but to unaccredited investors, they're more happy with just buying in their neighborhood. Hey, there's a building down the street from me. I can drive by it every day. I know if it's being taken care of. And hey, 7%, that's better than any, you know, uh, uh, yeah. savings account is earning. But with, with them, are you getting the sense that they're more buying just the ability to label themselves a proprietor of, of some establishment, or is it that they're actually interested in investing in the community? It is more social investing. It's yeah. more, I want to be an owner, mm-hmm. and and that drives a lot of the, um, the, breweries. the breweries. Yeah, I want to go in, I want to have that owner's card, and I want to get a free beer or whatever. Yep. <laughs> um, but then also um, becoming part of their neighborhood and, and yeah. taking an active role in their neighborhood, I think is really uh, kind of a common theme of a lot of people who are investing in real estate especially and the the accredited investors are tend to be more dollar they want to see right a good pro forma and be like okay this this is better than this other seven that i have over here. right exactly yeah. and it kind of goes back to the whole you know uh kind of accredited versus unaccredited they they're used to getting all these awesome ideas and also awesome, awesome investments coming their way you know the average unaccredited investor is not you know has not been given the opportunity to invest a hundred thousand and make a 20 percent return that's a that's a new concept to them. Huh? That is so true, and it's it's <laughs> so funny if you think about it, just in the sense of you know if you approach, I, I'm sure everyone has someone who is in that accredited investor, mm-hmm. in, you know, in their network. If you go up to them and say, hey, you want to open a fill in the blank, it's yeah. like no. Right. Go. What's the matter with you? Yeah. But if you ask someone, you know, who, who's maybe younger or, or not quite in that demographic yet, they get a little bit more excited. They at least want to hear what you have to say. Right. I don't know. Do you agree with that, guys? I would agree. Yeah, they tend to be flattered by the opportunity and yeah, intrigued. Well, for look sure. at the idea of Kickstarter. I mean, if right. Kickstarter didn't happen, we wouldn't be even having this conversation. And the whole concept that you can invest in something and get nothing, but just for that ability that you can help move a company forward that you believe in yeah i mean that's that's an insane that's awesome and um and, and, and the know. goodwill things that indiegogo has done mm-hmm. as well right. and that's incredible fund me and all the other ones so there's you know. gary we wrote a book that thank you economy which yeah. is yeah. kind of a piggyback off the crowdfunding and what you're saying now as well the book that you're writing mm-hmm. uh which it, it's like i said it just it makes sense and um one thing that i i, I think we've had a uh, just like with anything new, challenge is really just education piece because mm-hmm. uh, everything is so new and people are so locked into the the regular way of you know in, investment or financial advisor, the four hundred one k, the standard things. That how do you kind of hey here's this new thing, here's a new platform. What's been kind of your strategy or some successes you can share when it comes to just uh, the general population and, and education and I just keep telling the stories like on this podcast and yep. over and over and over and everyone that I meet and uh, you know at most you're going to kind of move uh, you know all of us collectively around the country talking about this you're going to move around 5% of the population to understand it better most people don't care most people don't want to know whatever uh, but slowly if you can move 5% of the population that's 5% that talks to somebody else over the course of several decades you you kind of move into a whole new way of of, of viewing investments and maybe it won't take a couple decades but certainly looking at the history of it over the past 10 years and how glacially slow it has moved um you know i'm not too overly optimistic that we'll all understand this but yeah i think uh the technology was one major holdup but when that was kind of right. already put in place um you know we had that piece of the puzzle done now we have you know the the federal government the state governments and and just getting uh, things passed or, or you know to to get moving and of course with government you know things go very very fast right mm-hmm. um, yeah, right <laughs> and um, I think once, you know, who knows, you know, with the new president and everything and, you know, 2017 and beyond, um, if if in fact things do speed up and you don't have this huge process and bunch of this red tape that um, it could take off where, you know, that would be the opportunity where not many, very few people are even playing in right now. Um, and, you know, it could shift in a big and a major way. I hope I certainly hope so, because we have, you know, all our chips um, in that type of uh, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, because I've been certainly slowed down in my development. 
by government oversight. And it has been very frustrating. But also, a lot of the initial players that came into this that were just in it for a quick buck have gone out of business. And so I, I got to look at that both positively and negatively. Mm-hmm. You know, the slow pace has helped this develop in a proper fashion rather than just kind of burn up uh, on reentry. You know, so uh, I'm. I, I'm cautiously watching what goes on, you know, like stripping, Caution, cautiously optimistic, yeah, like stripping Ryan. away, <laughs> stripping away too much uh, federal re- regulation could actually have a, a bad effect on right. us because it just allows more players and more it to kind of go to pot faster. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, there's, I'm always that, there's always that lowest common denominator that you have to worry about. Well, I think the, the, the way um, this is growing within kind of the grassroots movement type where it's, you know, on a, a local block by block, by block city mm-hmm. and state level where people have sen- sense of ownership and community, uh, which will help kind of, you know, like maybe not 100 percent, you know, get rid of you know, fraud or whatnot, right. but it will you know, it will help because, right. you know, people are not going to want to, you know, do bad business within their community. Right. Yeah, yeah we're certainly not pitching, you know, buying a, a, a retail center on Fifth Avenue in New York City. I mean, we're talking <laughs> about here right. in our local market with people that, you know, we'd have to see face to face and answer to. So I think that local is another big part of the movement as well. Huge. Sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, I... I was an investor back when I didn't know what investing was, so a decade ago in mm-hmm. a in a REIT, and that was probably my first try at real estate sure. outside of me buying my first property. Uh, and you know, if you look at the numbers, just over the decade of the span, it's it, I mean, it it was the most horrible investment in the world right. um, but somehow that's past he's all he's still salty about that he's yeah, still I, am. <laughs> I am I am I'm still in it and I'm still salty about it uh, but to me it's just like wow how did this get past the government and the right. regulators and all this where right. um, it, there's some fine print in there you know these results aren't guaranteed and you know next thing you know you're losing money and you've got and you don't no know why and, and, and the worst part is you know I can't do anything about it right and so I was like, hmm, here I can do anything and everything about it. And if, you know, our investors, they can do anything and everything about it, too, especially when it comes to real estate, because we can go to a property and fix things. We can uh, rent something that's vacant. Uh, right. We can take immediate action, which to me is just, you know, it, it makes sense. So I'm glad I learned that lesson yeah. a, a decade ago. <laughs> So it's better to control your own destiny, that's for sure. Right. So a, I think yeah, I think exactly what you're doing is is a great way for people to start breaking into it and, and, and doing that more. It's I think it's gonna bring a lot of communities together and make people a lot of money. Um and, and not necessarily the people running them, like typically happens in, in a lot of these sure. Wall Street transactions, right. but the people investing. Um, you know, leaving some meat on the bone for them is an extremely important, often overlooked thing in the investment world. So, yeah, And that's a good point. There's a lot less um, kind of uh, layers of management of investments like this. So more of your money goes directly into the investment. Very little of it goes into the pocket of the people just running it. Yeah. I was going to ask you, um, just kind of, you know, going to 2017, you know, you, you're working or you're almost done with your book that you've mm-hmm. written. And we've talked about um, single family homes and investing through real estate, through renting. Um, just kind of wondering what your thoughts are on, um, you know, what Renters Warehouse calls the rent estate mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, people wanting to rent. And if that's the new quote unquote norm. In, in in our reality. I do see that as a, a growing trend. I don't think it'll overtake home ownership. It, it might not, it not even eventually be that big of a dent in the overall market. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that we did cross kind of a psychological hurdle that renting's not that big of a deal. You know, it used to be that, you know, kind of in the early 2000s, right. the only people that rented were like, you know, you don't have enough money yet, you haven't put enough money away, you don't make enough money. You know, the like what's wrong with you look. Exactly, right, yeah. yeah. Like, why would you do that? And and a lot of people now are renting. They're choosing to rent. Yep. And it's not a I, I am myself too, right. choosing to rent. Well, yes. I'm trying to convince my wife to go to that third. I'm trying to convince Ryan now. to rent too. <laughs> <laughs> He's not won that argument, yet. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. But yeah, you're it, it, it's just far more acceptable. And and you know, one of the biggest reasons that we had the foreclosure crisis that we did, you know, there's all the you know money, uh, yeah. you know, like kind of all, all the, the big short stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, however. 
there was an important psychological factor is that when my house is worth less than I owe on it and I can't afford it so well, I can walk away from it. I can just do that. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. That's, there wasn't a horrible thing, that, but that's a huge psychological shift. It used to be that real estate was bankable because people don't walk away from their homes except in extraordinary circumstances. My grandpa, you know, if he lost his home, he'd move to a different town, he'd change his name, he'd live for the rest of his life <laughs> under the shadow that his house got foreclosed on. Now it's no big deal. You know, people did strategic foreclosure, go buy a bigger, nicer home right. while the market's low and just let my cheaper home go into foreclosure. It was right. a tactic. I, yeah, I think you touched on it really now. The mindset is shifting and changing. That's uh, I've been having a lot of these discussions with somebody that's, you know, let's say twice my age who mm -hmm. still has the home ownership kind of right. mentality and what that entails. But um, now that the mind shift uh, or mind change has started, um, I think that, you know, in my eyes that it's here to stay. Right. And uh, people look at it very differently. And, and you should because, um, you know, just from a mobility perspective right. where, you know, how many people are, you know, going to school and some in one place and then they have a job at a different place and, you know, having you know, the flexibility to move, uh, you know, just like that will will only grow. It won't stagnate or go down, in my opinion. Now, that's not to say that, that this is changing everything, but right. we're, you know, from 5% maybe having that point of view, now it's more like 15%. You right. know, it's still... The home ownership has still got a huge place in our economy yep. and a huge place in our mindset. So I'm not saying that that has gone away. It's just right. it's there is a a, a shift of five to ten percent well, in that well, direction. Well, like you mentioned, I think that if somebody tells you, "Oh, I rent here," mm -hmm. you don't have that view that you may have right. had ten years ago. What's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they may rent something that's you know. Right. much more than someone's mortgage exactly so, um yeah it's a it's a very good point mm -hmm. yeah. so i think that was really informative we got a lot of uh, yeah. good good information in there uh the book is again is mindset methods and metrics got to check it out i'm excited to dive into that and read yeah. it uh, i'm going to order one right now and, uh, we'll, and we'll link it all up on every on yep our, yeah we'll, we'll be in the we'll notes uh in the the description as well uh the 506c information it's really interesting that's I 100% agree that's going to be the wave of the future I'm excited to, to see you kind of you know leading the charge on that so thank you so much for being here thanks for having me yep thank, thank you, you. Thanks. thanks everyone